Afros on Share with your girl, Sheila O. And this is How Far. How far now? How you all doing? Hope you all keeping safe. Hope you all still social distancing and making sure you all do the needful, okay? Because life as we know it has changed, but we have to just keep up with the Joneses, as they say. We have to keep up with life, all right? Don't let it wear you down. My guest today, she's retired. But man, she's still rocking, okay? She retired from the African Union as the head of the Division of Gender Coordination and Outreach of the Women, Gender and Development Directorate in December 2013. The beauty of her is that the ramification and scope of her work with the OAU is reflected in the history and the progressive evolution of women and gender issues in the organization ever since she joined the Den Women's Unit when it was established in 1992. That's what we're talking about here. That's what's up. Mrs. Tariba, ma'am, how you all doing? How far now? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Enjoying retirement, enjoying Chicago, enjoying my grandchildren, and um, coping with after retirement life, which is beautiful. Which is priceless. You look so beautiful today, I must say. Thank you, thank you so glowing, much. Glowing, glowing, glowing. <laughs> First of all, congratulations on your virtual book entitled An Enriched Life. Love thank that you. title. Thank Within you. your years of research, ma'am, what have you seen is the biggest problem with gender equality, especially within third world countries in Africa? I think, I think the, the problem is um, our tradition, mm. our culture and tradition which we have to realize is always changing. Nothing is static. What we just believe that, you know, if something happened to my parents, it must happen to my children. And usually women are the ones behind it, which is great because we hold up the culture and tradition of the society and keep the society going. So I, I believe that um, if we change our mindset about our culture and tradition, most things are likely to go well. Okay. Is this something that you think that can be fixed, starting with the youth of the countries that this affect? I think it affects all nations in the world. Right. It just varies from place to place because the problem of um, gender equality is the same wherever you are, whether you are in the most developed country or you are in the least developed country. And I believe that we can break the cycle from if, if we if you focus on the youth especially the girl child yeah. and i believe the way you can break the cycle is through education formal and informal education because um what once uh, I, you know it, it depends on which aspects you want me to talk about but to break the cycle like i said you have to target the youth the yes. young world and at the same time you have to work with men Women have a way of always talking to themselves and talking about how bad things are, the gender equality, so forgetting that right now the power is still with the men. You have to work with the men. The men, we are the mothers of the boys that became the men. True. So we have, we have to work with the men because they still have the majority of the power. And from my experience, once the men know that this is what you are talking about, their attitude change and most of the time they become very good allies in, mm. in, in talking about uh, or fighting for women issues. So I believe that um, we, it, yeah, you have to go through all the various age groups right, to make a difference. Right. Yes. Totally get it. So the youth, the men, you know, the key factors that affect what we are trying to address. Can and you also define, the women. I'm sorry. And also women. And also women because we cannot assume that women know mm. about their rights. True. Because so like I was talking about tradition and culture and so on, at times women just assume, for example, that, you know, I was always in the kitchen with my mom, my brothers were playing outside. It has to be so with my children and so on. So it's everybody in the society collectively. Only you have to design the program that targets the group that you want to focus on. I'm sorry about that. No, no. Thank you for saying that because I actually remembered something that happened way back in Nigeria, something I read about where the current president, uh, President Buhari, referred to his wife, who's a medical doctor, you know, where he said she had to put, she had to keep her place in the kitchen because she had something she had to say 
to empower the country. But apparently, I think he took offense to it and he publicly said that even though she's a doctor, her place was in the kitchen. So yes, you are right. Mm -hmm. Women are also affect women should know where they stand. Really yeah. appreciate that. But can you Thank also you. tell me the definition? Because I don't know. What, would, what is the definition of gender mainstreaming? Gender mainstreaming is to say that in every facet of life, yeah. issues affect women differently from men. The girl child from the boy child, even from birth, yeah. you know, the, um, the issue of um, child preference, you know, this is our belief that, you know, it's very important to have a male child to carry the name forward and things like that. So when you talk about gender mainstreaming, is to look at how every aspect of societal values or development affects both sexes. Because if you, uh, let, let me just talk about um, the issue of education. Yes. In a limited, in a home, well, resources are always limited. In a home with limited resources, and there are lots of children, you can find that they will say, that, okay, this, let, let me send the girl to go and learn a trade and the boy to go to school mm. because the, the little money that we have in the family will benefit the boy better because he will keep the family name and he's likely to get a good job and look after us and so on. So gender mainstreaming means that both sexes should be given equal opportunities yes. to, to attend school. And even when they are in school, you don't assume that the boys should go towards the sciences and the girls should go towards um, home economics and things like that. So you give them, so it means that, you know, you have to start from the primary school and you have to tell the teachers that, you know, you don't try to choose for, for the children right. what they should be tending towards. Because, and also at home, you don't um, buy trucks, toy trucks for your, for your son and just get the dogs for the girl. You, you should give them equal opportunities to decide, you know, the girl may want to play with Lego or build towers with them with the Lego and so on. Yep. So that's what we are calling um, the issue of gender mainstreaming comes in. That in every aspect of life, there is always a difference. We should consciously ensure that there is a balance um, when, when it comes to things like that. To both sexes. Okay, appreciate both sexes. that. sexes. What are the best ways to apply gender um, equality practices in third world countries when you have to consider the effects of politics? I, I believe that things have moved very, very fast okay. in Africa, except that the people, most people don't know their rights. Mm. At the African Union Commission, which is um, the successor organization that took over from the um, from the Organization of African Unity, the OAU. Right. The organization operates at the continental level. It's made up of uh, member states, meaning all the member states of Africa and member states of the African Union. And where I worked in Addis Ababa is, um, is the headquarters, like the secretariat of the African Union. And a lot of policy documents have been um, adopted by our heads of states. Right. In every facet of life, you name it, we have the policy. Agreed to through the meals, through the, um, routine, the, um, the way for getting the approval of our heads of state. Right. Meaning that the ambassadors will have looked at the programs or policies and programs and activities, then it goes to the um, foreign ministers mm -hmm. after the approval, the heads of state approve them. And they put their signature on all this. They adopt them and they are being monitored. But the problem is that when they go back home, there is nobody holding their feet to the fire to say that, you know, you went to Addis Ababa or you went to the summit, you agreed to these policies and so on. They have to be, they have to be implemented. Accountability, so, right? Accountability, yes. And, and that is why it's, it's I, I believe and I work very closely with um, the NGOs, non-governmental organizations, because the government may not be able to monitor itself. So the non-governmental organizations, we have to, because we work very closely with them, to yeah. say that, you know, you, you have to ensure that whatever has been adopted at the continental level, whether at the global level by the UN, 
all these things will have to be, all, the, all these policies, programs, and activities will have to be monitored. And at the level of the African Union also, we have programs in place to monitor what is happening at the level of uh, in our member states. Right. But the thing is that um, you have to realize that the African Union is a member states organization. Mm. So you have to know how to implore them to, uh, to carry out the, what they have been committed to. But it's very, very important back home for everybody to be aware also that they have a role to play. It should not have anything to do with politics. It's good governance. Yes, yes, totally agree with you. Um, in addition to what you just said now, since you joined the OAU, okay, in, in 1989, yeah? Yes. Are there any key advances or progresses that you have actually seen the union accomplish to date? And what more can be done? In terms of accomplishments, you, you have to realize that um, the, you cannot move the accomplishments of the organization from its member states. Right. And the organization is as good as its parts, and that is the member states. So in terms of achievement, mm -hmm. like I mentioned, it's in terms of putting policies, programs, and activities in place that will have to be, um, to, to be, to be implemented. Um, in that case, in the, in the area of gender um, policy and programs, I can safely say that the issue of the gender parity principle, now it is um, against the law to, for any member states not to have equal number of men and women in any decision-making position yes. because that is, the, that is the law they, or they themselves adopted. Yes to say that the gender parity principle is non-negotiable. So for the first time since the establishment of the um, OAU and then the AU, mm -hmm. we now have five male commissioners and five female commissioners. And we also, so that's something that I was very much at the center of. Mm -hmm. And um, so that is a very big achievement. So it has to trickle down. It shouldn't be up there alone. Yeah. Even in our member states, you know, when you have the ministers, there has to be equal number of female and male ministers. You cannot say that they, they are, the, the people are not there. They are there. They're there. And we, and we have to make sure that where they say they are not there, then things have to be put in place to say that, you know, in terms of education, in terms of um, opportunities, to be able to be to, to be there because it is not true. Yeah. There are people, there are, there are women that are there. So that's a major, major achievement. Then so many of the issues that are um, adopted at the level of the, uh, at the UN level, that's at the continent, um, well, um, at the global level. Yeah. The voice of the African, um, African people are there because the, um, we have the African common position on any issue, whether it's the issue of aging, the issue of education, you name it, science and technology, aviation, all of them. So you have um, in, at the headquarters, you have departments that deal very, very seriously with these issues. So make sure that the African voice is always there. Right. And that is why it's very, very important for Africa to always be together. You have the European Union, you have the African Union, and you have the Union of Member States of the Americas and all that. So it's very, very important for Africa to speak with one voice. And that is the avenue that is there to make sure that Africa speaks with one voice. You so, have you have been you have been so entertaining, you've been very educational. I wanted uh, what I wanted from this interview was what I got. We wanted your wisdom. You know, we have a very young audience here on the Afrozone show. Um, the you. show is nationally syndicated and it was important to have um, expatriates like yourself come and talk about, you know, the books you've written, talk about your life experience. And there's a lot our listeners can take out of this. I really appreciate it. Uh, one thing I want to know as well is how can people gain access to your book? How can we get hold of your the, the virtual copy of um, Enrich, The Enriched Life? Um, the um, I have a copy of the the um, here. There it is. It. <laughs> there it <laughs> is. That, that is the that is the hard cover. That's a hard copy. Okay, hard yes. cover. If you if if you go to 
um, Yetunde Teriba, that's my name, yetundeteriba.com. Um, all you need to do is to click on what you want, whether you want the hardcover or you want the Nook or the iBook or, or Amazon mm -hmm. Kindle, all of them are there. So it will take you to, to decide to purchase it. The book itself, the hardcover, which is um, a labor of love. <laughs> yeah, because um, I say a labor of love because it's self, I did self-publishing because I always like to learn. Yeah. So I self-published my book and um, it's just $25. I made sure that it's something it's that uh, everybody would be able to afford, especially young people. Because it's very important, even diplomats need this book. I, like somebody said when we were doing the launch, I wasn't even thinking of that. So one of the launchers that read the book said, said that. So I think it's, it's a book for everybody. You want to see how Lagos was growing up, how we used to pick coins in, in, the, in the drainage, you know, after rain and the rain and so on. All, all kinds of, um, so to get the book, just go to yetundeteriba.com. We're going to have it um, typed out, you know, okay. so that people can have access to it. Okay. Um, are, there, are there anybody, is there anybody that, you know, you want to say thank you to that played a major role towards this book? I know there's so many, but maybe major, some of your contributors, I want to give you this opportunity to just uh, reach out to them and say thank you. I want to start by saying thank you to you for putting this book together. <laughs> and I know I'm going to get a copy and I know I'm going to learn Definitely. a lot from it. But yes. is there anybody that you... Uh, Mrs. Yetunde Teriba would like to thank for the book's success? First, first of all, it's God. It's God. Right. Because right. It's, ta it's, taking, it's taking me 13 years to write the book. Wow. I thought I would have launched the book as I was, um, as I was leaving the organization at the end of 2013. Mm. But because my husband was ill, I had to put it aside and face looking after him because it was my priority and so on. So I thank God that I was now able to finish the book. I also thank my husband because he, I think the person that you you are yoked with yeah. determines your future. That's so true. If you marry, if one marries strongly, male or female, it will determine one's future. So I really thank my husband yeah. because we, we our, our, our our courtship was only for seven months. Wow. And we were married for 41 years. Oh my God. Before, he, before he passed, yeah, wow. recently. He passed only three months ago. I'm sorry. And I also want to thank my my eldest, one of my elder sisters who said, okay, our father died. Um, there was no family or anybody to help. Yeah. But she, she, she believed that, you know, wherever she couldn't get to, myself and my immediate senior brother would get there. She made sure that I got the scholarship from Lagos State Government wow. to go to, because without a scholarship, there was no way I would have been able to go to the University of Badon to study. Right. They even chose the, they, they chose the subject I should study. They said, you have to go and read English because we yeah. need administrators in Lagos. That's true. Because I wanted, I, I wanted law. They said, no, we had too many lawyers <laughs> and so on. So I, I really thank, um, so I want to thank Lagos State also for, for that opportunity. Mm. And I also thank, um, my sister that I was talking about, yeah. she she made sure that I was okay also, to the extent that, you know, it was because of her that I went to the University of Badon. And even when I was having my babies, yeah. we would pick her up from the university, we would go to her house in Bodidia, pick her to go to UCH to have the babies. She would be outside there throughout. She's been my rock and support even to date. We talk almost every day. Beautiful. Even up till now so uh, she's somebody that i deserves the the thank and i also thank my my children they are the best i mean in terms of they never gave me problems i didn't i didn't spare the road <laughs> them also so i thank yeah. them I, when you invest your emotions in your children it comes back to you especially in your old age or when things are very difficult yeah. so i thank my children i thank um the my, one of my brothers that did all the research for, mm. for the family. I thank the family that took me in the Ayori days wow. um, when when I was in secondary school in Lagos. And my sister, I didn't mention her name. Her name is Ola uh, Ola Bike Ola Sokwe Miss Ola Sokwe Miss Ola Sokwe. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So, I know all my colleagues, friends, all those that I met, and I yeah. have some fantastic friends. 
you know, um, I'm not somebody to be moving about with friends, but I've had lots of quality friends that have been there for me. Even when I moved to Chicago here, there are some that will do anything. They will give, like you say here, yeah. the last shirt, the shirt on their back or the blouse on their back. And so, yeah. and, in it. and I also thank my church. That is the um, Jesus House Chicago. Okay. We have a fantastic pastor and the people, oh my goodness, they will go to any extent for you. They're very, very big support system. Beautiful. So, yes. And um, I also thank the my consultant, the firm uh, um, that um, helped in the letter that took me through the process of um, having my book as a reality. I, yes. I, um, yes. God Culture is the name of the company. Okay. So I thank. I have a lot of people to thank, and I also thank you okay. for for having me on this show. Thank you. I really appreciate you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been a great, great, great time. Uh, we've spent here with you on the AfroZone show. We look forward to getting your book and yes. we look forward to you publishing more books. Thank you yes. so much, Mrs. Yeti Thank Mr. So Reba. Much. Thanks Thank for being our guest. We appreciate Thank you. So you. Much. I really appreciate you. Thank okay. you so much. God bless. God bless. Stay blessed. Thank I will. Bye-bye. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>